and uh, my name is Vinay Dixit and I today had the user experience design practice to my team. We are an IT services organization. We develop software for enterprises and also for consumers. And uh, we believe that uh, we have to deliver meaningful solutions to our customers in order to create and uh, and societies to flourish at the end of it. So that's the company that I work with. And uh, in the design space, within the user experience practice at Mindy, we believe that uh, we have to teach computers more about humans. Uh, I think there has been a time when humans have learned about technology, learned about computers, and learned about uh, how to use mobile phones, which never existed 20 years back, and then. I think we've done enough amount of learning already and it's a time when computers have to learn about us and uh, that's what we try and do. So today's uh, topic that I'm going to be talking about for the next 20-25 odd minutes is around simplexity. Now you would be wondering as to what is this word for simplexity. Has anybody heard this word before? It doesn't exist in Oxford Dictionary by the way. Yeah, so there are a few books, I know people are raising hands, there are a few books which are written around simplexity. Uh, so I'm going to take a design angle to simplexity and talk about as to how we understand how do you bring simplicity in the design solutions that we create for our customers and they talk and divide into three parts. So we'll probably start with talking about what simplicity is really all about and why it cannot exist without really thinking about complexity. And then how do you do as designers sitting here how do you really work with complexity and simplicity at the same time to create solutions that are meaningful and experiential and uh, simple at the same time. So those are the three things that I'm going to be talking about. So it'll be like a little sort of a taxing moving towards the laptop and if you have a clicker that would be great. You need a USB skin there. Yeah. Give me a moment. Let's see by the time it comes up, uh, technology at the end of it. So I thought that, uh, you know, every, uh, you know, design, if you go back and if you sort of go back in the literature of design, you don't find documentation 50, 60 years back and so on and so forth because design never existed as a beyond that. So we said, okay, fine, let's talk about what are the other design disciplines existed at that time and can we learn something from them? So if you really talk about uh, some of the design disciplines which existed more than 300, 400 years ago, we're talking about architecture, industrial design, and communication design. So what is it that we can learn from there? Uh, can't see part of it. So if you look at uh, beyond, uh, you can't actually. So the way design actually started, uh, I'm talking about the pre sort of ornamental era when things were made to look beautiful. They were very, very ornamental. You know, everything was sort of possessed, created for the beauty that it has and so on and so forth. And then during 1900s, we sort of experienced something uh, called modernism. And uh, there were designers, there were thinkers who started working with things like, how, how can we sort of follow the form following the function, purest international style. Can we design products and buildings that are not very, very specific to a region or a culture? They actually go across boundaries. Something that can be experienced in the US can also be equally experienced in India without having people to sort of learn, unlearn what they know already about the product and so on and so forth. Like today if you experience um, iPhone, it works equally well in India as well as in our right? Because it's truly an international product, truly an international style. People were following minimalism, absence of decoration and all that. And that is the time when designers were saying, hey, you know what, less is more. So you have to work with less and achieve more. But then there was completely different thought process came into picture. There was completely different school of thought. When people said that, you know what, less is actually more. You need to do more. So you would see a lot of you know, fusion of forms, mixing of classical and modern forms and so on and so forth. So you could see buildings, you could see designs. Those were equally ornamental and equally functional at the same time, being usable. And now we live in an era which is called neo-modern, wherein we believe that you know, 
there's a lot of steel, there's a lot of form, there's a lot of styling that is again very, very international, but we're creating intelligent buildings. We are also looking at as to how do we revive older styles and so on and so forth. So what you see is that it's also a cycle. It's also a different school of thoughts. Something, you can't say that, you know, less is bored or less is more at the same time because it's going to repeat again and, and you will experience the same ornamentalism, simplicity, something which is very, very international, keep coming back and keep, keep going back where it came from. So, I don't know how many people recognize this picture here. There's a great German architect and a designer called uh, Ludwig uh, Wenderhof Mies, popularly known as Mies. And Mies, is, there's this building called Farnsworth House in the US, as first of his own work in the, in the US. And uh, this work was, became such a classical thing in terms of thinking about minimalism. So if you look at this building, it's pure white, it's uh, forced concrete, it's done on pillars and uh, columns and pillars and it uses glass. This whole thinking about making buildings looks very, very minimalistic was something which was new in its own sense by that time. This was the guy who thought, said, you know, let's push ornamentalism back, let's sort of eliminate complexity out of the products that we create and let's create something which is very, very functional, simple and straightforward like this building. But then somebody actually challenged him and that guy was Robert Venturi and who came with, who actually coined this word called Less is Bored. And this is a building that you see in Wu Hall which is in Princeton uh, University, very close to New Jersey, New York area. And uh, you see this building uses elements of ornamentalism, elements of beauty, elements of form, elements of function and so on and so forth. Because this guy was completely against me saying that you know less is actually bored. He said that if you don't do if you don't do more, you will actually add a lot of boredom to the life of people, and that's the reason why you got to do more. You got to do more with, with what you have. And at the same time, there's another thinker who was sort of taking emerging, and I'm sure that many of you would have heard of him, would have appreciated his work, would have read about him, and that guy was Dieter Rams who came up with this term called do less but do it for better. And uh, how many of you know that, you know, are you aware of who Dieteram is? Everybody is aware of it, obviously. So Dieteram was the head of industrial design for Braun and as part of his 40 years of career at Braun, he created a range of products which was so minimalistic, so straightforward, you know, uh, form follows function or function follows form, he never believed in those things and he said that all you got to do is that you have got to design for people and you have to make things extremely simple. So one of his quotes which I really loved is simplicity is about is you know hopelessly subtle and many of its defining characteristics are implicit that it hides in simplicity itself. Very very deep comment, very very uh, something that if you go deep inside it you understand as to what he really meant at that time. One of his products, something that I really admire, is actually a blender and you can see the simplicity of it. It doesn't even have any sort of instructions, not even instructions around, you know, uh, the dial of the product. You can see two forms fus fusing inside each other, you know, one laying on top of the other. There's a sense of balance here, and I don't know whether how many of you can notice because of display quality, but there's only a red dot there, and that says all. So simplicity is also about subtracting what is obvious and adding to adding the meaningful to back to it. For example, these are two products from the same brand, from the same company. And uh, you see something that is on the left side, which was designed by Dieter Rams. Can you guess when? The new one was designed in 2009, the right one that you see, the blue one, was designed in 2009. The, the one that you see on the left hand side, was designed in 1969. So that's when he designed it. But there was a survey done sometime back and when people have showed these two pictures and asked consumers as to which one would you buy, everybody said the left one. Right? So look at the kind of simplicity the guy brought in, the designer brought in to his design, which obviously as a brand, you know, as I said that this whole cycle of making things simpler and making things complex at the same time 
will probably happen at all times. You can't really avoid yourself going through it. Something, uh, the, the left hand side, which is a pocket radio, first invented by Braun, designed by uh, Dieter Rams, was created again sometimes in mid 70s. And uh, uh, Jonathan Ives used it to create the first generation of iPod because he obviously believes in its work. You would see the same set of thinking also going back into communication design. So it's not limited to buildings, it's not limited to products. It's equally applicable when you design communication for others, right? So you would see Starbucks logo, and you, you would see that from where Starbucks has started in 19, you know, late 1990s and all that, and uh, where it is now, and the logo is becoming more and more minimalistic. In fact, to an extent that they have eliminated Starbucks as a name from the logo itself, which is a big step for a consumer's company. Right? And today, you know, gurus are predicting that tomorrow you may see this mummy is crowned with a, you know, green circle behind it and nothing else. And people will still recognize a Starbucks as a brand. Simplicity is also about standing for core values. How many of you know what this is? Beyond this an eye, beyond this a peeler. Mm. Scraper, yes. So it's it's a it's a peeler from a company called OXO. How many you know OXO? No? Some, yes, many. Alright. So OXO is a company. Uh, the founder died uh, last year, Sam Feber. And uh, Sam Feber believes in standing for the core values of the product. So OXO creates a variety of products for kitchenware. So women working in kitchen or anybody who's working in the kitchen would use a variety of tools to work. And he said that while you're working in the kitchen, you are sort of a little messy. The hands could be wet or could be messed up with other things. And you need solid grip on the products that you use in the kitchen. So you need to design kitchen ways very, very differently. So Ox as a company took that as a good value and designed everything that they designed, keeping the grip on the handles or on those kitchen ware products very, very differently. So all Oxo products are not known for anything but the grip that they have. Just want to add on that. So they also, I think they are friendly for like uh, people who have dyslexia and then. Uh, Absolutely. Then so Sam Fiber's wife, she was actually had, had a you know problem in her hand. She was not mm -hmm. able to use some of these products, and that's where he got inspired. So love makes people travel long distances, <laughs> and that's where Oxo is today. Uh, you know, it's not my talk. Just like the gentleman, if anybody wants to add something, please go ahead and add. So I think we understood simplicity. We understood as to you know how it has sort of grown and evolved over a period of time. I think it's also a matter of time, complexity. We should understand, we should give it a thought. Because if complexity does not understand, we will probably never be able to understand what simplicity is really about. Uh, I believe that you can learn about life through various ways. Sometimes you can learn a lot of books, a lot of journals about you know what really meaning of life is all about. But then sometimes a quote can do a better justice understanding life. So you know this is something from Oscar Wilde, uh, who I really admire. He says that we live in an age when unnecessary things are our only necessity. So as human beings, we keep designing, and as designers, we keep designing, and we keep producing stuff that we don't need but we still go and buy it, whether it is iPhone 6 or 6 Plus. Things that seem complicated can be very, very simple, and things are looks very simple can actually be very, very complicated. For example, if you look at any typical hand watch, like a manual watch, you would sort of pull it up, open it up, and you would see the cogs and the gears and the wheels and the springs all of it is so complex. The structure itself is so complex, the mechanism is very, very complex. But then, what it really does, that whole complexity, what it does, it just allows those two hands to move accurately. And that's the only job. Right? But if you look at those two hands would tell us a very, very important piece of information that runs our life, that it's 10-10, right? And I have to do something at this time. So, 
if you get the complex stuff can drive very very simple things can drive a life as complex as ours for example i think uh, ganesh already spoke about google uh, while google search experience which means spitting a few keywords firing a search getting results that sounds so easy but is google simple i don't think so the kind of work that has gone behind making the search experience possible in terms of the algorithms that are working behind scenes uh, the kind of scientists and data scientists that are working behind the scenes to make that experience possible for you i think that level of job is very very complex however we don't recognize it we don't realize it for us it's just firing a simple search and as human beings i think we all love complexities we i i'm sure that you know people sitting in room people here would like to listen to philosophy would also like to listen to read poetry and they also like relationships any of it is simple <laughs> no way right sorry if, but the last one you agree i know <laughs> i know i know last one i think everybody would agree here yeah yeah but i believe that you know philosophy is equally complex and so is poetry but relationships are super complex but we love them so the three principles to it one is content versus control now if you look at uh, all the games that we design deliver we say that content has to be very very complex if you design games to be simple there are no takers of them nobody would, nobody would buy games that are simple to sort of execute simple to command and uh, simple to play the content has to be very very complex but does not mean that the game controls the jockeys and the you know the, the gaming consoles and all that things that you will design around it in terms of ability to give ability to people to play those games you have to design them to also be complex no you don't have to and you know similarly i don't know how many of you if you are bike riders what's the fun in riding a bike on a straight road with no traffic nothing right speed. you speed can give you thrill but can also give you kill it's just the right right it's just the right it's the right it's just the right okay all right so why do you think that uh, the tracks that you enjoy seeing people driving formula 1 and everything else are designed to be fairly complex and not straight because you enjoy curving you enjoy maneuvering your bikes and your vehicles and so on and so forth and uh, and that's the fun in it it's also the fun that's the fun in it <laughs> already now simplicity you cannot achieve honestly without adding complexity in your life it's just not possible so imagine somebody said you know what we have a lot of currency in our pockets we are you know wallets are filled with currency notes and everything else let's define that concept let's introduce credit cards right so credit card will allow you to sort of uh, carry the same or maybe more amount of cash or buying power uh, just by carrying the card and uh, and that's about it right so we we thought the simple wow the concept is simple but really it wasn't we are trying to replace paper with plastic but then what happened we had multiple cards we have multiple banks that we are dealing with we have surcharges we have loyalty points to manage we have payment cycles we have multiple pins that we keep forgetting we have cost centers to deal with we have frauds we have theft and we have over spending to deal with as well right so while the concept of changing paper to plastic sounded so simple but then it resulted into a lot more complexity than we never imagined was it was it designed with the thought of simplicity i mean all of these are benefiting some other groups so was it i wonder if see it's the intent could be an intent that would have started from a economic need the... right so today you have introduced google is coming with payment system and so on so forth now the google is trying to simplify your life no. although they are selling it like that to you that you know your life will be simplified but they are saying that every transaction that you will make i take 3% of it in my pocket but obviously we buy simplicity and not google's promises complexity also required because businesses the point that you were just touching upon businesses want to make more sale in the end of it right so they want to sell these cars 
This car has about 32 controls on the steering wheels, out of which probably I'll probably use only five, and so on and so forth. And equally well for washing machines like these ones. But then the idea is that people believe that if there is, if the product has more number of features or less number of features, it's less capable. <coughs> less features means less capability in that product. Right? And people don't want to compromise on capability of a product. At the same time, people always want to be the control of what they use. So they don't want things to become automated while they can, while technology can allow things to become automated. We as users, we as consumers don't want it to happen automatically. What we want is that I should be in the control, so give me those controls which I can handle the product with. So businesses use that as a way to make more sales. So if simplicity and complexity, as I said, needs to coexist, we need some way to sort of deal with it. We just can't design products without thinking of complexity and simplicity at the same time. There are many ways to achieve simplicity and uh, this is you know, my own version, my own sort of way of thinking like a structure and you should just look at it and forget about it, don't try and use it, it's not going to be useful to you. Uh, if you look at, uh, you have complexity and simplicity on one side and utility and function and delight of a product on the other side. This is where probably you will start, wherein you are thinking of complexity that's complex and you are also thinking about utility and features that it allows you to give. But if you look at the second quadrant, which is simplicity and utility and function, you will get usable products, but then you will not see differentiation. And if you look at, if you have a very, very complex product, like an SAP or an Oracle, CRM and whatnot, and if you say that, you know, let's just forcefully make it delightful by adding some gamification features to it, right? That's actually fooling yourself, because that's not going to, going to drive any sort of a consumer behavioral change if the product value is not going to increase. So this is not going to help you. So I think the, as designers, as product managers, as people who are building products, what, where you need to really focus is where you can deal with delight and simplicity at the same time. And honestly, that's not going to come easy. So there are possible ways in which you can achieve making products, making services much more simpler while dealing with complexity at the same time. But as like many other human created laws, these are also breakable, you can mend them. You can use them, you can forget about them as you walk out of this meeting or as you walk out of this talk. One is move it far. So why why people think that you know iPhone is a slightly more simpler product to deal with as opposed to Android or any other operating system is because what they have carefully done is that they have moved the complex part of it into a software like an iTunes, which allows it to do allows it to, to do like little more complex jobs managing, moving, backup and whatnot, right? But all of it you can't do on iPhone. So what you do is that you don't deal with complexity. It's like, you know, you have a problem with traffic, you build a flyover. You're not really solving the problem. You're just move, letting people, letting the traffic from one side go to the other side and that's about it. Uh, second is you have to eliminate. You have to eliminate, but you have to eliminate thoughtfully. The more you eliminate, the, the more product value that you will reduce and at some point in time you have to decide whether people will still buy that product or not. So, you don't have to downgrade, you don't have to make it more, but you have to think about how do you still be able to eliminate to make it simple. Don't give people too many choices and that's the challenge. How do you, you know, the whole concept of paradox of choices, how do you give less number of choices to people to make their lives much simpler? Make things much more visual. What's wrong with this information? Clutter. Absolutely, clutter, right? You remove the clutter, you get something like this, and confusing, and you sort of bring some more organization, you, lick, you, you get something like this. So what you do, you have data, you convert it first into information, and that tells you inside. And if you know that if you're running a school, that's probably wisdom for you because that's going to make you a lot of money in Bangalore. Making information more visual. So instead of giving people as to you know what sort of coffee it is, you know how much froth it has, how much milk it has, how much cream it has, you can actually convert it into a simpler, much more visual format, and that you would see that you know people are able to comp compare and comprehend very well. 
designed for speed anything that is fast or anything even that looks fast like you know there was a time when people were experimenting with forms that looked fast right the fridge used to come in a aerodynamic shape and so was your irons and and so was your civic machine and so and so forth and the whole purpose was uh, you know defined uh, styling deception which means that you the thing doesn't work so fast just that it looks fast instant gratification don't have time but this is my favorite guy uh, Brett Victor uh, I, I would encourage people to go and search for Brett, Brett Victor on Vimeo and uh, look at living by principles and uh, you'll find a lot of uh, interesting stuff said by this guy who works for Google give people scarce you know make things scarce for people you know again something which is connected to uh, paradox of choices why Dribble is so popular among designers community is that because it doesn't allow you to upload stuff in bulk it says that you have only four slots once you finish all four slots once you get x number of flights on those slots then I'm going to open up another slot for you that you can use to upload one more piece of your work and that looks perfect to people because it is care it allows people to work inside constraints and it's not free flow they recognize patterns but the question was is it simple in terms of for simplicity for me in this workflow would be whatever I want to do yeah I mean, what, how many images probably I want to upload yeah it's simple I mean I just put it it's just upload yeah so the constraint so running out of time, but uh, but but immediately after that we'll have a discussion. Make things much more human. Have conversations, not with very systematic conversations, like you know this set of wizard, which gives you very very uh, instead of technical way of having conversations with you, you can have very very human ways of having conversations. And we said that make it visual. So this is a site in uh, US, Hipmunk, and it allows you to sort of search for flight information very, very differently. Uh, instead of a list, it shows you a very visual format of price versus the timings at which the flights are flying, and it makes it very easy for you to make those choices. It's called Hipmunk. Isn't it? Hipmunk. Always think of context when you're designing for users. Always think of what they're trying to achieve. In this case, there's a shipment, and uh, and uh, uh, you're trying to track a shipment, somebody designed a lousy grid to show shipment information. However, had you sort of thought about it, how can I make it much more visual and experiential? Probably you would have come up with a design like this, which, which shows you different shipments using a set of colors, using a set of graphics, uh, and using a set of uh, visual cues to sort of inform you, guide you, educate you as to where your shipment is lying, and what could be a possible next, next best action that you can perform to manage your shipment. So I love this design, whoever thought about it, genius designer. And this is last. I think adding humor to conversation makes things much more lighter and simpler. That's what my personal belief is. And if you see the signage is on the left, one says no parking, violators will be towed away at owner's expense. The other one says cup side pickup only, all the others will be crushed and melted. Right? So you, you like it. You enjoy it. And this one is directly from southwest.com. I'm going to read it for people who can't obviously read it. Uh, in the event of sudden loss of cabin pressure, oxygen mask will descend from ceiling. Stop screaming, grab the mask, and pull it over your face. If you have a child traveling with you, secure a mask before assisting with theirs. If you're traveling with two small children, decide now which one you love more. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to smoke, the smoking section on this airplane is on the wings. And if you can light them, you can smoke them. And there may be 50 ways to leave your lover, relationships. But there are only four ways out of this aircraft. Right? So what happens is that, now this was a very sort of a boring piece of information. Something which could be sometimes technical as well. You can try and tell this to people in a forcible manner or you can try and teach this to people. but people don't remember these things. But if you add a little bit of a humor, I think that conversation becomes much more simpler, right? So that's all that I had. Uh, I wish I could spend more time, but uh, you know, that's the only luxury that we have, 30 minutes. Uh, any other discussions, I'm available on the floor. Please come over and we'll have it. Thank you very much.